This is Leonore from Five Iron Frenzy, and you're listening to my chapter of As the Story Grows. Welcome to the next chapter of As the Story Grows. I'm Brad Patton. This week, I'm excited to have Leonor Ortega Till from Five Iron Frenzy on the podcast. Five Iron Frenzy released their seventh full length record, Until This Shakes Apart, back in January, and I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't. Leonor and I chat about the early days of Five Iron Frenzy, the band's relationship with MXPX, the Ska documentary, Leonor's project with Scott and Andy, The Fast Feeling, and the challenges of being an eight person band. We also talk about the band's lyrical depth, past and present. This was a fun chat, and I tried to cover a lot of stuff over a short period of time. And I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Leonore from Five Iron Frenzy. How's it going? It's good. How are you doing? Good. How has this year been for you? It's been weird. It's been a lot of hanging out with my kids and my husband, which is awesome, <laughs> but maybe a bit much because I'm high energy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of time at my house, but also a lot of time getting to know people through Zoom, through you know phone calls, through Facebook. So making some new friends that I normally wouldn't have had time for. Yeah, yeah. How has like Colorado and Denver been in pandemic it's, vibe as far as Yeah, it's kind of balanced. It's weird because we take it pretty seriously as far as masks go, but we're mm-hmm. not so heavy handed that nothing is open. Yeah. So I feel like there's a balance in everything, Colorado. Um, which I like. Like yeah. you can choose what you want to do, but you have to be safe and follow the rules and then you can do more. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I got good, my second shot balance. yesterday, dude. My arm is so sore oh, today. Oh. Last night, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> oh, man. I was good. Well, how are you doing? You you're, seem to be pretty good for second shot. <laughs> I, I, I got mine, and I was wrecked right. that night, and I like couldn't sleep. But then I right. was like pretty good the next day. So I was wrecked last night, but I'm feeling better. I just had to whine a lot about my arm. <laughs> huh. That makes sense. Right. That makes sense. Well, you are a Denver native, yes? Yes, I'm well, not Denver, Colorado yeah, native. Colorado, so, yeah. yeah, so over kind of, you know, north, there's Fort Collins and Greeley. And my parents are yeah. both Mexican American from uh, neighborhoods in Fort Collins and Greeley. So I was born in New Mexico, but pretty much grew up here. Gotcha. What was childhood like? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I was born in 76. So growing up in the late 70s, 80s, I think our parents were around, but not really. I think, (laughs) you know, it's kind of like, hang out, don't get into trouble. We lived in dirt roads. So you kind of knew where you're not supposed to go. But Mm -hmm. we didn't have a lot of parental supervision or (laughs) I mean, I I hear my suburban friends and they're like, my parents wouldn't let me watch Smurfs. And I'm like, I had no censorship as a kid. It's (laughs) like, what do you want to watch? Where do you want to go? What do you want to eat? What do you want to drink? We were the house with Twinkies and soda. Yeah, you say nice, but <laughs> maybe maybe it's good. I mean, I, maybe I, don't. I I mean, our neighbor kids came over because they were like, "Your mom stalks you with all of this junk food." Um, it was nice, but we were definitely latchkey kids. Yeah. You know, both of my parents commuted to work and worked until about seven, so mm. we were on our own, which is good, but also bad because we yeah. got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. What got you into music? Well, I've said this in a couple podcasts before, but my dad is, he thinks he's a great musician, but he's terrible. (laughs) He grew up with a big family. I think he has like six, well, he has six brothers and they all play different instruments. And back in the day, instruments were pretty big in the uh, Spanish church. So he played trumpet. My uncles played, you know, guitar, um, saxophone, different instruments. And so 
growing up, we had a music room in our house and it had a piano. And my dad thought if you play the high notes that they're right, even if they're wrong, like, <laughs> so he played a Motown records and like Stevie wonder and um, earth, wind and fire and a lot of Spanish music. And yeah, he just got me a saxophone at age nine and we started jamming. We were just jam all the time. And that got me into music. It was just something to do. And, you know, something fun to do with my dad. I was daddy's girl. You're rocking out. That's fun. Did you instantly take to saxophone and have this love and appreciation for it or? Yeah, I has, I did actually, because my grandpa, uh, Pete Faustino Ortega, he was a jazz musician back in the day. Um, and I just felt proud to play yeah. saxophone. It just felt like the cool thing to do. And then I played in school and our school was tiny. Like I was the only tenor saxophone player and maybe three alto sax players when I played that marching band, pep band. And I identified kind of as a nerd anyway. Yeah. So that, those were my people. I found that the thespians and the musicians of school were the cool goth punk kind of interesting kids. And that just kind of paved a way for thinking saxophone was cool. And then you add ska and it's like, Oh man, all doors are open now for the nerds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did that come into play? Yeah. Cause yeah, the, the ska scene and, I don't, I don't what was the music scene like in in Colorado at that time and growing up like there there were some punk bands that came through so what's interesting is there weren't a lot of venues in Greeley and Fort Collins and especially not all ages mm -hmm. so I had to kind of sneak my way through the back door to go to the 21 and up shows <laughs> which I did um I remember the first time I saw Skank and Pickle was at the State Armory in Greeley probably mm -hmm. 92 or 93 and um was just like, what is this chaos? There are <laughs> horns, there are people flailing about, it's fun. But I mostly started getting into punk. And, you know, the punk scene back in Greeley, again, Exhumator would play. Uh, we didn't have much of a punk scene, but the guys in Exhumator, which was this metal Christian band, yeah. would come through and play the Sobriety Coffee House. <laughs> 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 if you can imagine, it's like, it's the Sobriety Coffee House. So it's basically like AA dungeon and there was a venue called the fire escape which was basically like i don't think it was a youth group i don't think it had a religious connection but it was the place where it was sober fun you yeah. know and so it was all ages and this band exhumator would come through and my cousin micah ortega was in the band mm -hmm. and i got to know these guys these crazy weird christian metal kids keith and reese and scott and they were the guys that ended up creating a ska band called Five Iron Frenzy. And uh, so from going to like Christian punk shows and metal shows, I was always the weird chick backstage <laughs> and got to be in their band. They're like, you know, we want to have a horn line. And I was like, well, I play saxophone. I didn't tell them I was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as like ska goes, I didn't know how to play, but I played an instrument and they were like, yeah, that's what we're going for. And so I was in high school at the time and started driving up to Denver for band practice and was like, what is this? What is this band house? This band house has a Bible study. These people are weird. They're cool. They're <laughs> legit. Let's do it. <laughs> That's funny. So that was your first band, Five Arm Frenzy? Your... No, my no. first band was Arson the Arson. Isn't uh, that a cool name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it is, but according to Scott, it's supposed to be Arson the Arsonist. Hmm. But Our Son the Arson was a punk band that I started when I was a junior in high school, and I sang, and I was like the punk chick, dude, shaved yeah. head, um, you know, fishnets, and we played probably a total of like six shows, we played um, Fort Morgan, Colorado, the VFW. We played some Bad Leather Bands. We played the Sobriety Coffee Shop. Yeah. <laughs> and then we played our guitar player's dad's divorce party. Oh, man. <laughs> he, had, he had a divorce bonfire <laughs> in which we covered Knocking on Heaven's uh, Door twice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And at those shows, the, the one that we did in Fort Morgan, Colorado, which you have to understand, this is the tiniest town ever. We roll up and I'm biting the heads off of peeps and throwing them <laughs> into the crowd, like kind of Ozzy Osbourne-esque. <laughs> we had a song about oh, Kurt man. Cobain. We had a song about vampires. We were pretty oh, terrible. Man. Terrible. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. When you're young, yeah. you'll play any show that comes your way, no matter how awkward it is later oh, in life absolutely it's so awkward because it's like we we like we had no songs so it's like 
play the same song twice. Do they like knocking on heaven's door? Do it again. <laughs> uh, how'd you guys oh, get wow. connected with five minute walk? Oh, well, we, this is a cool story. So we played this festival called a uh, vision fest vision quest. I don't know what it is. It's basically, it's a big parking lot, probably in a church. And, uh, we rolled up, turns out we were kind of jerks because we didn't know that the headlining band, which was Dime Store Profits, was from out of town. They were supposed to play last. We were late showing up. We already okay. had had a show that day. So we rolled up with all of our other friends and we're basically like, put us on last because we're here now, <laughs> which is total jerk move. But we got on stage and exploded. If you've seen our band, it's like a three ring oh, yeah. circus. The songs are okay. The heart is definitely there. The the chaos, the meaning, the fans, the fun. We did our thing. And Masaki, who was um, in Dime Store Profits, called Frank Tate, who was the president of Five Minute Walk, or the owner of Five Minute Walk, put it that yeah. way, and called him from a payphone and said, these guys are awesome. They're fun, they're cool, and they love the Lord. And Frank Tate kind of interviewed us and interviewed our pastor at the time. We had a band pastor, and we were very missional Christian band at the time. And so Frank basically took a, a big risk, a big gamble, and said, yes, we're signing you. Flew us out or maybe drove us out. I don't know. But we got to California. He put on a show at this warehouse called The Scream. The crowd went ballistic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Moshing, crowd surfing. We're going insane. And you can just see Frank is on the side of the stage, and his eyeballs are about to pop out of his head <laughs> saying, this is good, but this is, what did I, from college rock <laughs> to punk, what did I do? <laughs> So that's, that's how it was a good fit. Yeah, that's amazing. And were you guys, I know from, I think when uh, Scott talked, Scott or Andy talked to Billy Power, that Billy basically blocked you guys from tooth and nail because he didn't want another ska band. Were you guys shopping other labels at the no, time? No, we, we knew that we did not, personally, we didn't want to sign with tooth and nail. Oh, and it's okay. nothing against, I mean, cool yeah. people maybe, but that wasn't our vibe. We never, that was one that we said no, because, um, it was, it was too big and it was too um, spread out. You know, we didn't want to be on a, I, in some ways we're kind of different because we shop around and we wanted, we didn't want to be necessarily special, but we didn't want to be just one of dozens. Yeah. And the cool thing about five minute walk, honestly, I'll be very honest for me, I didn't grow up with the Christian subculture. So very yeah. soon they started having spiritual retreats and, basically like all these college rockers and the people, the admin people and the office people were so cool. Yeah. So legit. I was 18 right out of the box, you know, leaving my parents, you know, traveling the world for the first time and meeting these men and women that Justin McRoberts, Masaki, um, Frank and his wife, Liana, they were basically um, mentors, spiritual mentors when for me personally. What was that reception early on and like that first record? Like, I, I know people have talked about this new record as being political, but you guys like Reese and, and Dennis, you guys have never shied away from being political. I mean, the opening track on Upbeats and Beatdown is about the slaughter of Native Americans. <laughs> like, uh, I know. I think when I think, because I have a 14 year old son and I think, wow, would I go to the Christian bookstore and buy him a, a you know, record and the first word is let's rape and kill and steal. And right. <laughs> fortunately, because of my bent, I definitely would. I think that we were saying things that weren't said before, but it was under the guise of fun and funny and you have the artwork. And right. so the parents didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. Back then the kids could say, mom, I got this at the Christian bookstore, family Christian bookstore, you know, Berean Christian bookstore. And the parents are like, oh, good for you, honey. Put it on your Walkman. And little did they know that <laughs> the lyrics are kind of saying um, things that I think need to be said. And our main lyricist, Reese Roper, he was definitely um, had his finger on the pulse of yeah. Native American um, indigenous issues and what the church had done under the guise of the church and manifest destiny was always kind of like, well, it's bad. It's basically mm -hmm. bad. And so you think of 
Native Americans or African Americans or Hispanic Americans coming to faith under Jesus Christ, under the thumb of the persecution, how would those people have recognized that Jesus can be amazing and good regardless of the terrible atrocities done to their people? Yeah. And that speaks to me. That to me is amazing and and just a story right there. Yeah. Yeah. Because when I was younger, what I connected with was like the fun and the energy and the sound and like when you're older, you listen to lyrics and you're like, oh, there's something deep here um, that you didn't notice the first time around or in those early years. And like, what was that balance of trying to like say something and be serious, but also, you know, Arnold Willis and Mr. Drummond, like, I mean, like, <laughs> well, that's the thing. So people might not notice, but Arnold and Willis and Mr. Drummond has a, a social point too. Reese yeah. Roper said he grew up, you know, in uh, the mountains of Colorado and didn't know very many African-American people. And so that was his entry into African-American culture. And so it's weird, but a lot of the lyrics have a stronger point than what is on the surface. Yeah. For instance, you know, Blue Comb 78 was about his parents' divorce. Uh -huh. And so a lot of these lyrics, they're fun at, you know, first listen, like you listen to where the zero meets the 15 and he's yeah. saying, how can I save the world on cup of soup and student loans? But when you've been there, yeah. that is a deep, real feeling, right? For people our age. Yeah. Um, so at the same time we were writing and singing these songs, we were trying to live out the message of Jesus. How do you love people that are drunk, that are broken, that are mean to you, that have no boundaries, that take advantage of you, that are different than you? Um, and how do you love the jerks, the Pharisees in the church that say, you can come to our church if you take your piercings out. How do you recognize that we might be brothers and sisters too without yeah. being jerks to them? So there was a lot of um, there was a lot of faith living out. And, and something I'm learning now that I'm in my 40s is that when you're in your 20s, everything is dogmatic. Mm -hmm. When you're in your 20s, whether you're a vegan or whether you're straight edge or whether you're Christian, you're just, you're, you're, so outspoken about everything right yeah. and so now as i get older i'm like man i had some strong line in the sand beliefs and now i'm like wow it's it's interesting to get older and say hmm let's look at some of these things and let's look at the messages and the way we said it and is that loving yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was listening to some like vegan hardcore record the other day and they're some lives they're just like you fucking murderer and i'm just like <laughs> Yeah. Well, they listen to NIV like from back in the right, day and they're right. talking about abortion the same way. And it's right. like, everything is so like, <laughs> right. Meat is murder. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's, I tried, you know, the, I was a strict vegetarian from age 16 to 31. Yeah. And all those years I toured, I was a vegetarian. For me, it was about the rights of um, Mexican American immigrants who yeah. worked at Montfort's in Greeley, Colorado. And I saw that every time they tried to unionize or get their rights, they were all wiped out the plant would close they were all fired and basically um, threatened with immigration yeah. and then Montforts would open up later and start them out at four bucks an hour slaughtering and doing these dangerous mm. jobs and it was my stand but now i like some pepperoni <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm terrible uh vegan food, <laughs> vegetarian foods come a long way since then though you know it's it's wild yeah not for me not for me <laughs> <laughs> Young girls pine. I don't have the time. Did you guys notice a drop off at some point as you get to uh, Electric Boogaloo and the end is near uh, as ska kind of waned? I don't know if it waned in the Christian scene the same way it did in the mainstream, but it definitely had that tail, I think, there at the end of the first run of the band. I think we were one of those bands that. I mean, there, there might be some pushback from this, but, you know, when you become rock with horns, you yeah. know, and you kind of like rock it from the crypt or basically the horns became more of the texture, not necessarily mm -hmm. the ska upbeats. And our, yeah. our later albums, um, I'm proud of them, but they definitely became more Jimmy World, Weezer, um, No Effects, kind of more punk, more rock. And the horns were kind of 
sidelines. But then when you go to the shows, because in the shows we were playing stuff from the old catalog, people who went to the shows were definitely wanting a ska show too. Yeah. So I think we saw some, some people go away. But then when we basically announced our last tour, then it was like, oh no, everybody's going to come out for this because yeah. that's it. And, and I think that show, we did like a medley of some yeah. of our, you know, our greatest hits. We couldn't play them all possibly in an hour and a half. So the medley kind of would have the main parts of some of everybody's loved songs. And that was a good way to appease with the rocker songs and then the combat chucks we didn't want to play anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you guys find your audience or your reception among your peers and among mainstream crowds like later in your career? Was it tough to break through as kind of like as as the ska scene dissipated in the Christian scene and it was broken right. up? I think it'd be nice to say Warp Tour helped, but I don't really think. I think at Warp Tour, it was basically five iron fans would come to our show, yeah. but not necessarily they might also want to see a couple other bands, but it's, it's a weird world because I think now, later, we've gotten more cred with the quote-unquote secular crew. Yeah. And there, there's more, um, and, and I think that partly has to do with our fans becoming secular. Some yeah. of our fans have, you know, not necessarily <laughs> followed in the, in the Christian life. And so they're, they're accepting other music and they're sharing our music and the interviews and the ska documentary yeah. certainly got us out there. So I think that there will always be those diehard Christian fans that listen to Michael W. Smith and they listen to Carmen and they listen to Five Iron. But then there's also the people that are really into ska and they listen to ME330 and Less Than Jake and Five Iron. <laughs> so you get you get both types. Yeah, I yeah, I saw you guys. Uh, I can't remember if you played at 930 Club or if you were at the Fillmore in Silver Spring when you did the uh, uh, when 930 you reunited. Club for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you reunited and did the tour with uh, Real Big Fish. Right. So fun. Stage. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. And it was great. It seemed like everybody was, was having a good time and, and enjoying both bands. I think, and, it was and I think at that point it was, they understood real big fish understood and they're, you know, not just them, but the management understood we can mix these two. We yeah. can mix and, and five iron fans want to come and have a beer and get a babysitter now too. Yeah. And real big fish fans, um, you know, they're in for a good time. And even if they don't know Five Iron Frenzy, they like a good time and they're open to it. So it was a really good fit. Yeah. That tour was awesome. I'll just be honest. It, like, it, it was awesome to so watch. Cool. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's amazing for me to play with really stellar horn musicians. Like yeah. their horn line, you, you bring your game when you're playing with other good bands, like legit musicians. It just makes you proud to be a horn player. What was your reaction to the Kickstarter response when you reunited and announced that first record? I mean, the second one was equally as huge and massive, but like, oh, the first did one you expect was insane. it? No, I, <laughs> I was the person that was honestly out of the whole band. I was the one that said we should probably do 60 days, not 30, because I thought, <laughs> how are we going to raise this much money? And I'm thinking, yeah, we can ask our parents and our friends and there's some fans in the, you know, the woodwork, but I thought 60 days was playing it safe just in case we're having to really push at the end. Yeah. And boy, I was wrong. <laughs> the first, um, when it first happened, I was on, you know, my computer and I was hitting refresh and just, it would go up by, you know, a thousand, 5,000 every few minutes. Yeah. And I really was, honestly, I was moved to tears. I was moved to tears when I saw that number climb and climb so quickly. <laughs> How did uh, kind of the relationship with MXPX and these weekend shows you guys have been doing pre-COVID uh, work out? That has been an amazing gift to me. Um, to be honest, we didn't really, well, personally, I didn't know the MXPX guys back in the day. We knew them very, very little. We didn't tour with them. We played festivals with them, but we weren't the best of friends like we were with some other Christian bands, like mm -hmm. um, mostly because at the big festivals, especially Cornerstone, they were paired opposite of us. We would play at the same time so that one crowd wouldn't be too big. Yeah. So I'd be bummed out. I'd be like, oh, we're playing at the same time as MXPX again, because I, I do think they give a great show and their hits are hits. Man, they're great writers. But our management um, 
over easy booking is the same management as MXPX and they started billing us together. And it's honestly, it is a perfect fit because the same people that want to go to a show and have a few beers, maybe sit at the balcony or maybe go down into the crowd and mosh a couple songs. The same five iron kids want to see MXPX and they give like, they give such a legit musical performance. Mm -hmm. They are primo. Like they don't mess around their equipment, their live show, the effort that they put into it, they're not, it's, it's not like you take it for granted and say, we're going to play a show. It's like, we're bringing our A game every yeah. show. And I think for five iron, it's been good for us to be paired with them because it gives us a level of um, integrity, but also something to look forward to something to look up to and new friends, like not just the guys in the band, which we've gotten to know, but also their crew is so professional yeah. and the booking agent and they're, they're, they're not just the kind of people that like put a flyer up. It's like, no, you're going to make videos. You're going to promote the show. You're going to care about the show. Um, you're going to care about the fans. And so dude, I'm blown away by being part of like, if you can consider us part of a team with them, that's yeah. makes my day. <laughs> it's amazing. That's awesome. How'd you get connected with the Scott documentary? Me personally, I got a Facebook message from Taylor, um, the director, and he said, I'm making a ska movie. Do you want to be interviewed? And I said, yes. And turns out I was the first person to say yes (laughs) for the interview. And then later as we got to know each other, he said, you were the first, Five Iron was the first ska band that I, you know, learned about back in the day. And um, you, Leonor, know a lot of the musicians that I want to interview. Would you help me connect the dots? And so Back to the Beach was happening, and he said, you know, we're getting an Airbnb, a really nice one. We're bringing a film crew. Would you call some of these musicians and see if you can legitimize this film? Because they get requests all the time, but this is going to be a real movie. And I said, yeah, dude, like, let me call them. So I'd call, like, the guys in Less and Jake and be, this is Jeff, Leonor from Five Iron Frenzy. (laughs) It's been a long time. So just kind of connecting Taylor to um, different band members that I had met through the years. And even some of the bands that I didn't, you know, really know very well, just saying, you know, I'm in Five Iron, would you be willing to do this interview? And just, we had a a vehicle, we'd take them back and forth to the Airbnb, we would scout out different places. I pretty much got involved and then surprisingly was billed as a producer for doing all of that, which I don't even know what a producer (laughs) is, but I guess I was doing it. And then I also got to um, hook them up with an interview with Matt, um, from the Supertones here in Denver and did my interview too. So yeah, it was an amazing project and it, it, the, the big, big viewing happened in uh, California Mm. at a film festival. And so at the actual sold out um, big screening were tons of ska musicians and it just blew my mind to be a part of that too. It was so cool. the uh the idea for the fast feeling come about uh that's kind of weird and funny (laughs) basically it's it's very interesting how it came about because scott kerr of five iron frenzy is super prolific songwriter and so um i mean he's the kind of guy and i think he's used this where he says he puts his pants on one leg at a time and he can write a song (laughs) like it's true he does not lack for awesome songs especially to me like i'm his biggest fan um So he had written dozens of songs for a new Five Iron album after we released Engines. And we just didn't have time and weren't really, um, as a band, we were, we weren't ready, I guess. Uh, But for whatever reason, they kind of sat there. There was a massive folder, massive. And so one day I was going through them and I was like, maybe I'll just put some lyrics, uh, you know, filler lyrics and melodies to these using uh, my phone and send them to Scott. He's, you know, he works from home sometimes and, I started doing that one day and he's like, these are pretty cool. These are pretty cool. And I kept going, kept going. And by the end of that day, going back and forth with him, he's like, you can kind of sing. And I kind (laughs) of like some of these ideas. Why don't you come over and we'll see what we can do. And I was like, I like to sing, but with Scott's, you know, 
abilities, you know, using all of the uh, technology, I think we could do something really fun. And so yeah. we stuck with it. We added um, Matt Langston, who's in a band called 117, who also is a producer of vocals. And so he flew out and helped me. And then Andy wanted to do drums on it, which is perfect because his, um, his sensibilities with Scott's songs are just awesome. And so we just decided to make a band. It was like, let's do a new wavy kind of yeah. side project. And, and it was, it was kind of a one-off, but it was a dream come true to me yeah. like, to have my lyrics. And I'm super pumped about it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's such a fun record. I, I dig it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. It blows my mind that we even made it because it's so different for five iron. But if you really listen, those songs could have been five iron songs. Like if you would have twisted them a different way, those songs were intended to be five iron songs. It just goes to show that there's versatility in Scott's writing. Both records, Five Irons Done, Since Reuniting, Engine, and the new one, uh, I mean, I think they're both the best work the band has done. They feel like some of the most complete records. And I think the last two records Five Iron did leading into this, like, they're way more cohesive, in my opinion, right. as, as a as a listener. Um, right. And, and I've really dug that. What, what has driven the sound? Because like you said, you've gone more into the rock with horns. When you came back and did Engine, was there ever this idea of like, maybe we should make a ska record or? I don't think we, we never really talk about music like that. Like okay. Scott will come up some, with some songs, Andy might, Micah might, Reese might. Um, everybody adds and it's a very organic process. There's never a conversation of how much ska, how much punk, how much yeah. this. I'm one of the driving forces for, we'll say faster punk, which <laughs> makes some people nuts. Uh, Dennis tends to get some songs in the albums that are awesome mid-tempo stuff. Mm -hmm. um, some of the songs that he writes, um, he wrote One Heart on this new album. His stuff is just really laid back. And um, I think it adds a wonderful texture to the albums. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's cool. At the end of the day, it takes us a long time to figure out the sequence. Yeah, Everybody can submit the songs they want and we go back and forth. It takes a long time because... Um, for instance, this last album that we just put out, um, Until This Shakes Apart, the song Wildcat was not even going to be in it. Okay. And Dennis said, um, we had a different song in there, and Dennis was like, no, those lyrics, uh, the concept of um, the cracks are where the light comes through, that concept of redemption, that mm -hmm. lyric about there's a lot of jerks and we're doing a lot of finger pointing, but what would it look like to put this lyric of um, – of absolute conflict, conflicting humanity in there. Give this person a heart, even though he's a jerk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what would that look like? And that, the same was true for me. And I just liked the music too of that song. I was like, ah, this song is so good. It has to be in the album. How can it not be in the album? I get almost panicked, it's like visceral. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you love a song, you're like, how can we not put, like, that can't be a B-side or we can't wait. Um, so we go back and forth and there's some powerful, um, powerful conversations. Yeah. And the respect and the disagreements and the trust that we have to have with one of the, and, and the, and the, honestly, at the end of the day, the love, mm -hmm. the love, because there's eight of us and we're all very different. We're coming from different political, spiritual, um, music taste. We're coming from different backgrounds. Oh. And so how do we come to an agreement with one album? And I think at the end of the day, we did, we all yeah. wanted this album and same with engines. We all wanted that album. So no regrets. That's awesome. Was there ever a doubt that there would be this album, a new record? Yes, following yes. Yeah, every I mean. time, every time. <laughs> I have the CD right now. On my, I have the physical CD on my nightstand. And I was looking at it yesterday and I was, you know, touching it and saying to myself, every time we do this, it's a miracle to me. Yeah. Because there's eight of us. Yeah. <laughs> we have careers and we have lives and we have opinions. Yeah. And we have doubts. And so... Every time we do it, I'm like blown away. I'm like, we did it again. Okay, here we go. Like I, my mind is always blown and I'm always grateful, but I'm always like, it doesn't come without a cost.
So until this shakes apart, first new music since the EP in 2015, which was really besides from the yeah, record yeah. in 13. So <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's been a while. Was there ever any conversation about not just kickstarting it again, about like maybe trying to label or, or going a different avenue? Definitely not a label, only because okay. I think once you've been set free from uh, censorship, you're not yeah. going to go back. It's just, it's not in the conversation. Yeah. Um, we talked about Indiegogo versus Kickstarter. Um, but again, like I said, we all have jobs and the expense that it costs for us to fly out for a show, we're pretty much breaking even because you yeah. talk about eight people plus a sound person, plus, plus shipping all of the boxes and merch, plus the sound system that we bring, plus the hotels, plus renting vehicles. Like you're doing it because you love it. You're not mm -hmm. making money. Um, you might make a little bit of money, but it's basically an expensive hobby. Yeah. <laughs> and so to make an album, you have to recognize it costs money to get the production. It costs money to fly Reese out to Jeremy Griffith, who is an amazing producer. Yeah. And it costs money to mix and master. And then physically to put out vinyl these days, you know, all these oh, things yeah. we want to do, it's, it's expensive. So to do it the right way, you need, um, you need a machine and the Kickstarter and the fans have become our machine mm. and, and our beautiful support system. So, and not only that, but like for five iron, our fans are our friends. Like yeah. it sounds weird, but as I'm going through thousands of names on the Kickstarters, I'm like, Oh, I wonder how they are. <laughs> yeah. like, I know these people at this point, a lot of them. This is, as, as mentioned, this is a pretty politically, socially conscious, heavy record. Yes. Um, was there ever any like, maybe we shouldn't say that, maybe we'll get some pushback that we don't want, like? Well, Reese Roper writes the lyrics, and I think that he um, he just did it. He just yeah. did it, and uh, that was his conviction. And I think that the hard part was because we don't physically have the ability to be together in the same space, the mm -hmm. communication between the band members, the trust – the hugs, the looking in each other's faces um, wasn't there. So it was it was a bit of a challenge to say, for me anyway, to say, Reese, I trust you in this. I trust yeah. your heart in this. And it was hard for him to hear that um, and believe it because I've been a stickler for different types of messages and different types of um, different types of avenues for that message. I'm always the person that says, usually the person that says, I want to be honest, but I also want to be considerate and I also yeah. want to be loving. And I don't think there's a, a bad, a bad, I don't think it's bad that I err on the side of love, but sometimes the finger pointing needs to come out. And this season is one of those seasons, the last, yeah. the last season for our country, the last season for our, our world, the last season for our rights, it's been a struggle. And so we need to be more heavy handed. And I do mm. trust Reese in that, but it's, I think that he was concerned that not everybody was on the same page, but I'm proud. I'm yeah. super proud of the messaging. I never feel that it is inconsistent with the way we try to live our lives. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the rub is, is how do we live our lives? If we're going to say these things, how do we align ourselves with those beliefs? And it's, you want to be authentic to it, but I'm not going to say it's not hard. It is hard. <laughs> I happened to stumble upon this uh, review in CCM magazine. I know, right? Isn't yeah, that but, weird that they even took the time? <laughs> right. And, and and the last paragraph, it's until this shakes apart may challenge your conservative political views in some places, but the church umbrella needs, a big in, needs to be big enough to contain all policy perspectives if it's to be an effective agent for God's kingdom, which I was like, that's a great response when I would assume for them to be like, well, they said ass, so... Uh, <laughs> cancel them right like <laughs> i yeah it's so funny because it's like the the word ass took way too much 
priority <laughs> in the first month. It's like, shut up about that. Let's look at the, there was, there was, um, we released the song while supplies last on ska against racism, somewhat yeah. quietly and under the radar. And, uh, someone put out the meme where it was like, um, here I am listening to while supplies last while others are freaking out about the word ass. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's really get to the down and dirty concepts. Right. Yeah. I was surprised that, um, and I don't, I'm not a reader of CCM, but yeah, you know, if they want to embrace us, that's cool. I, I was shocked. I was yeah. shocked that that review came out and existed. And it makes me hopeful. Yeah. I guess that, that the church and that the, um, the voice of the conservative Christian world would say, these are conversations that we need to be having. Yeah. And it is true. They are conversations we need to be having. And so I'm not worried. Some people are worried that the quote unquote church is all going to go extremist. And I'm not because I can tell you my own convictions and say, I'm not worried. Um, mm -hmm. There is, there is difficulty in looking to Christ instead of looking to conspiracy theories, but <laughs> I can do that work. And if yeah. I can do that work, I certainly believe that others can. And hopefully this album will be a arrow in the right direction. Right? Yeah. Yeah. What in general has the response been? I mean, outside of the big controversy that is, I, I, there's two responses, the big one, the overarching one and the big one from people who still love Jesus um, and are trying to, to follow his ways has been, damn, you guys said it. I was yeah. hoping someone would say this. I was feeling this. I've been struggling with this. I've been feeling this. I just, you know, I'm happy to hear that people are saying this and not throwing out Jesus. Um, even though we're pretty upset and angry right now. And then the other one, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of people say, oh, this album is so angry. It's not for me. <laughs> and to the people that say this album is so angry, it's not for me. It's like, why aren't you angry? Maybe you're angry because you're not experiencing the lack of justice in your life. Mm -hmm. and, and that for me is, it's going to be, there's going to be five iron fans that say too angry, too political. And it's like, you have the, you have the beautiful, no, not beautiful. You have the sad, <laughs> the sad, um, I guess, right to say that, but it is sad that you don't recognize that there are others that don't experience mm -hmm. the lifestyle that you do, the benefits, the privilege, right? Yeah. I think I saw someone say punk shouldn't be political. And I was like, ah! are you, what, what, <laughs> what are you listening to, man? <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. Because Five Iron exists as this band that is, weekend warriors and and was there ever any concern with the timing of the release or was it just it's done let's get it out there yeah i don't think we get to decide too much on the timing it was weird yeah. we knew we <laughs> wanted to make this album and when things started moving they moved really fast i wasn't even ready it was like is it time to kick start and then suddenly we put 10 9 8 7 6 and it's like oh man do we know what the rewards are going to be do we know how much it costs <laughs> do we have a design and so um and we don't have a manager, which is good and bad. I think it's good because we know how to do a lot of the things and because we make managers want to pull out their hair. Yeah. Um, we're not a good client <laughs> at all, at all. Um, but, but it's hard because we also, like I said, we have different lives and we have different um, – sensibilities like some of us are optimists some of us are pessimists some of us are realists and it's like how are we going to get this done we're going to get it done just do it oh man we're not ready like um so when it happens it happens and i just i'm the kind of person that has to chill i'm a bossy person i'm a type mm -hmm. a person i'm the older sister and my personality wants to go really fast and and you can't you can't push art like that yeah art and i'm not one of the main songwriters and so i have to be okay with the process. Yes. I have to be okay with five different emails about five different bridges. <laughs> do I care at the end of the day? I do. I have my top two bridges. <laughs> um, but if you go this direction with this song, is it going to make it or break it? Maybe, but everybody has the right to say what they want to say in this band. And you have to allow for that conversation or the process is going to kill the band and yeah. you can't have that. Yeah. Because of the nature of the band and it's, dispersion especially reese being i guess is he still in virginia yeah mm -hmm. yeah does that limit do you feel like that's limiting to an album and like not being like yes. yeah it'd be great if we could put out a single every day of the year just we, throw it up on all, bandcamp and 
Yeah, we all feel that limit. We all feel <laughs> that limit because even for horns, writing a horn line, it's we do the best when we're in the same room. Yeah. We do the same work. And so Dennis flew out and uh, we wore our masks and we were in a big room, but Dennis and Scott and me and Brad listening to the parts, especially in Lonesome for Her Heroes, that solo that he did, yeah. I was sitting right next to him. I probably went deaf. <laughs> he did the same, like that trauma, rah, that growly thing about 50 times. And every time he'd be like, nope, do it again. Nope, do it again. Nope, do it again. And he <laughs> just wanted to get the right energy. <laughs> And then the three of us, Scott, myself, and Brad, would listen to the song and be like, we could do this, we could do that. And that's that organic writing together in the same room and seeing each other's faces, mm -hmm. it's priceless. And it's and it's easier when you yeah. know each other like that. It's easier for someone to be in the other room and say, can you play that an octave higher? Or can you do it this way instead of that way? Yeah, yeah. The technology hasn't changed that excitement of togetherness and then- Oh no, it's yeah. so hard and I feel, I feel grateful for Reese. Um, you know, he had to go to Florida and he wasn't in Denver. And that must have been hard because he had to get the feedback from us after the fact and yeah. try to fix some things. And it's it's a challenge because everybody has an opinion. And yeah. everybody has an opinion on your playing. And it's like, what gives you the audacity? But it's everybody's song. Yeah. Have you guys thought about the future? I mean, you kind of exist just freely where you can do whatever you want because the fans show up when you announce a Kickstarter. So you're just like, we released this record and that's it for now. And I, we'll see. We haven't, we haven't even had a legit band meeting since we put out the album. Um, we've had a couple of happy hours, which just means we have a beer or a drink and we get each other on zoom and look at each other's faces and say, <laughs> I miss you. I love you. Oh, there's your wife. Oh, there's your puppy. Oh, hi. How are you? Um, <laughs> but we haven't, um, been as proactive as maybe we could. And I think that's because with COVID, you know, yep. we don't know what the future holds. Last night, in fact, I shared with everybody that I got my, um, we always have like several band text yeah. going, you know? And so I shared, I got my second vaccine and Micah said, you know, me too, Scott got his first and, and Sonny has his and Reese. And so we haven't had the conversation. Who's had yours? What do you think about traveling? But I think that conversation is going to start happening. You know, do you want to stream? Do you want to fly out? What do we want to do? And so it's, again, I have to chill because my <laughs> personality says make everything happen. And my personality has to say, chill out when the band is ready they will be ready don't try to lead <laughs> um and that's hard for me again it's hard because i'm just a constant planner and i look at my calendar and i'm like i want everything five iron in here right now yeah. i just want to start practicing the new songs yeah um which there's nothing to say i couldn't start right now by myself but well we're going to start having those conversations very soon and i'm not worried because again five iron exists outside of time if we if we take seven hours to make what people say is one of our best albums. Yeah. Then why should we panic about time? Yeah. I'm just, I'm really grateful for all the podcasts. I'm grateful for people caring. I'm grateful for us getting our voice out there. And I'm, I'm more excited than ever to um, play a live show. And that's not just because we haven't been able to, it's because we have these new songs yeah. and they, when we get them there, dude, they're going to be so good. <laughs> and you know, those mosh pits are going to go off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to As the Story Grows. Our theme song was written and composed by the legendary Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe on iTunes and give the show a rating and review. 
If you'd like to support the show financially, click on the Patreon link at asthestorygrows.com. If you enjoyed this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I never felt so young